and uh, welcome back to Bonn. I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Antje von Bruck, I hope I've got the pronunciation okay, from uh, Friends of the Earth Germany. And uh, Antje, you're going to uh, talk to us a little bit of uh, targets and, and uh, mitigation targets and emissions cuts targets um, uh, through this process and hopefully we'll manage to clarify some of the more technical difficulties and, and uh, make it clear for our viewers. So um, I, guess, I guess the first question is, uh, what are the targets? What are, what are the pledges that have been made coming out of Copenhagen? Yeah, um, what we've seen from Copenhagen is pledges that are far too less. We are up to maximum 18% by the industrialized countries, while we know that we need 40% by 2020 compared to 1990 levels. And in addition to this, there's a number of loopholes which would water these pledges down. For instance, countries that had overachieved their commitments uh, in the first commitment period, which are most of the Eastern European countries, they have so-called um, carryovers, which, um, which they can either use in the second commitment period or they can sell them to others. And this was, would um, even lower the numbers. And then there is uh, different views on how the uh, land use and land use change and forestry is going to be used. And we might end up with even only 7 to 11 percent reductions compared to 1990 by 2020. So there's, there's two problems. There's firstly, these, the pledges themselves aren't enough. Uh, we need to hit 40% by 2020, and, right. and, and we haven't done that. And secondly, the pledges that have been made, there's these big loopholes. So let's, maybe could we just explore these loopholes very briefly? There's the, uh, the, you mentioned this problem with the, um, uh, kind of this, the hot air problem, uh, I think it's been described as, where some countries who overachieved their um, uh, kind of emissions reductions cuts last time uh, are now going to be able to carry these carry this over and, and in effect uh, you know, burn carbon that isn't currently being burnt. Is, is that kind of a fair enough summary? And, and if so, like what's being done about it? How do, how do we close it? Well, the problem is that by 2012, when the first commitment period ends, we might have a, um, carryovers uh, in like eight, no, seven to... 10.5 gigaton CO2 equivalents, so that is quite massive. And um, of course, countries that that hold these um, emission rights um, do see a chance to sell them on the global market, and that that is a source of income. So what we ask these countries to do is to not sell them, just leave them, and and. Um, if they want to make use of them, do that only in a domestic um, area, so not bring them to the market, because then actually we believe that, as I said, that no reductions or only few reductions need to be made, and that won't be safe for the, uh, for the, the environment. And, and now, is it kind of a, a problem which all countries are facing, or are there some countries that are uh, you know, meeting their, their targets and other countries that aren't? Or, you know, who are the bad guys and who are the good guys here? Yeah, of course there are countries that, that um, due to um, economic collapse in the 90s, like Russia, the Ukraine, Belarus, um, they, they have lots of lots of emissions that they can sell to the market. And then there are other countries like Austri Austria or Spain that haven't achieved their um, Kyoto targets at the moment. So they are keen on buying them. It's easier and cheaper than, than achieving them through national um, policy. And the others are keen on selling them. Yet we know um, achieving a goal of no more temperature rise than two degrees won't be uh, achievable by just, you know, just pushing on emission rights, which are a theoretical um, entity and do not change anything to the environment. Okay, so just to make clear for our viewers, we've been talking about the, the, the different tracks of the negotiations here. There's the Kyoto Protocol, which was um, lots of countries signed um, in the early or the mid 1990s. Um, and is this is this where these kind of targets have been laid down? The, the historical targets that um, uh, the kind of old Soviet bloc countries have met. It's under it's under this negotiating track. Is that correct? The first commitment period targets were made in the Kyoto track, yeah, and um, of course with the assumption that everything would go on like it went um, by that time. And then we had the um, 
and the, all the political changement, uh, changements and we had the economical collapse in, in these countries and all of a sudden they had m many less emissions than they calculated before so that's what we call the hot air. Um, it's not due to change in policy and that makes it very different to for instance what happened in countries like Great Britain and Germany where also due to policy arrangements we, we can see emissions um, being cut today. Okay, so there is, there is kind of a shining light there. It's not simply countries who've hit their targets because of economic collapse uh, or countries that haven't hit their targets. So are, are there any countries who've, you know, using good policy have, have you know, done an okay job so far? <laughs> Well, Germany is about to achieve its Kyoto target. Um, we have to admit that half of these reductions are also due to, to a collapse of industry, but half is due to national politics. So that that's fine. I mean, they are, you know, they are not the the golden example which they would like to be, but but they have achieved something through politics. Um, for instance, like feed-in tariffs for renewable energy is. A very good example how you can push for a new industry to come into play and to, to do its bits to reduce emissions. Okay, so before we kind of move on to discuss um, uh, targets that might be made in the future, um, uh, we can talk about the pledges made under the Copenhagen Accord and, and, and kind of the, the negotiations around this, this long term agreement that people are trying to forge here. Um, I have a question about uh, these countries that have met their targets due to industrial collapse. Um, where has the industry gone? Is it, is it disappeared into smoke or is it moved to other parts of the world? Or Because it, presumably if these emissions have simply been kind of transported to China or to India, then they're causing just as much harm in the atmosphere. Is, is that what's happening or is it something different? I mean, some has just have just disappeared. We have um, high unemployment rates in these countries. Um, some have been transferred. For instance, steel industry went to China, and of course, it's ca causing high emissions there. Um, but I think also some emissions were also only due to to the political system um, and the um, the system of plans to be fulfilled and and. This is not in play anymore, so this is really gone. And presumably, some some emissions have, have disappeared due to technological advances and an investment in, in green energy. Like coming to Germany, the number of wind farms here relative to the UK is is staggering. So I, I guess that must have had a difference as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to see that not only wind but also solar is um, actually quite popular in Germany. And um, as you experience here, the sun is not shining every day, and we are not the most um, attractive country to, to solar energy, but um, the government a couple of years ago decided that they really wanted to give a go for renewable energy. So we have this so-called feed-in tariffs, where when you produce um, power from renewable energy, you, you have to feed it into the grid, and the big um, utilities have to buy it to a certain set price. And that, of course, helped very much to develop um, these uh, technologies to get them deployed and also to get innovations in the area. Okay, so it sounds like there's, there has been some progress and, and these targets that were, that were kind of created under the Kyoto Protocol, um, various countries, there's kind of been varying degrees of success. Let's, let's go back to the, the, the kind of the state of the situation now and, and we're here in Bonn um, because countries are trying to negotiate new targets for, for the future. Um, and in Copenhagen, the, the hope was is that we'd have this kind of big agreement, which would uh, you know establish uh, what would be safe, and that we'd meet it, and it would all be wonderful, and we'd fly home, and the birds would sing. And instead, uh, it was uh, a disaster. Um, I think it's fair to say that those the words that told the word that Ivo uh, de Boer used yesterday when we spoke to him. Um, and so, where where now? The the, the pledges made under the so-called Copenhagen Accord are, are woefully inadequate. Um, they don't they don't meet the science, as far as I understand it. So, um, what what are the options? Who who can we push now? And, and you know, where where where's the leverage for, for getting getting a, a, some some progress here? Our biggest hope is to the Envi environmental ministers meeting um, at the end of this week in Brussels, and we really hope the EU for. Um, pushing the target of 20% by 2020 up to 30%. They have the unique chance at the moment to influence these negotiations, especially as we have another round in August here in Bonn. And um, 
due to the economic crisis, actually, it, it wouldn't be such a burden. Like, uh, industry is crying out saying we can't afford, but um, costs for emission rights went down because they have been t far more than, than we expected that we would need. Um, and um, actually, the cost for moving up to 30% would be only around 10% of the cost of fulfilling 20%. So there is a big chance to do that, and we are urging the ministers to, to move.